Good morning and welcome to all. Uh, respected Sangha, distinguished GBS of today's program, Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Geshe Ngawa Samdela, and uh, Professor Maduji, Professor Sisi Roaiji, and uh, Professor Anju Doji Nigiji, and uh, Yes, of honor is due and is on the way. So we are hopefully he will be in uh, five, ten minutes. Uh, so first of all, we have lightning of the lamb by our chief guest, Professor Samdenji and uh, Professor Maduji and Professor Sisi Roiji. Please. Thank you all. Now we have Mangal Charan, which is part of the both Indian and Tibetan tradition to pray for the success. For first, uh, Mangal Charan in Sanskrit. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you. Now in Mangalchara in Tibetan. Yes, I request uh, President Student Welfare Association to please offer a kata. Thank you, President. Now I request Professor Onju Doji to deliver the welcome speech. Professor Onju Doji, in Egiji. Namo Swasti. Telexu Gyurchi. Distinguished chairpersons, 
of this inaugural section of the two days National Symposium on Secret Geometry and Design in Nature, Interplay of the Earth, Science and Philosophy, Professor uh, Madhu Khannaji, Professor Sisir Royaji, Chief Guest, Professor Nong Samtinji, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of University, Guest of Honor, Professor KD Tripathiji, and all the eminent scholars uh, who have come here from various parts of the country to take part in the two-day national symposium on behalf of the university family and especially from the US organization committee, I would like to extend my warmness, greeting, and heartfelt welcome to all of you. I would also like to welcome to this inaugural section of the synonym, the director for teaching education, Tsering Dorjeji, the deans and the head of the various departments, all the scholars, staff, and students of the university. As all the scholars here are aware, Kashi and Sarnath are externally sacred place for Hindus and Buddhists. They are indeed like a Jerusalem for Jews and the Makkah for Muslims. Since ancient time, there may not be any of our great rishis and munis of the Hinduism and Buddhism, and as well as ardent devotees of these two faiths who have not visited Kashi and Sarnath once in their life. Even many of you among the visitor scholars may have already visited here several times. As Ashwagosh has said thus in the Buddha Charita, Kaste Vahina Tatha Vayu Vyomina Vari Bhumi Dhruvam Ubdesh Tatha Kashyam Gayayam Jnana Shyam. The gist of the line I quoted above is that just as prevalence of the fire in hood and air in space, water in earth are predetermined. In the same way, enlightened or attainment of Buddha in Buddha and the preaching of Dharma in Sarnath in Kashi by all the Buddhas are certain. Moreover, Kashi is the most ancient city of India and it is the center of its culture. To the Buddhist literature, Jatakas, the Shakyamuni Buddha, was born in Kashi several times. As King Brahmdat and Sarangna, the king of deer, etc., and accumulated the great amount of merit in this very sacred place. Similarly, according to the Manjim Nikaya in Pali, Vipashi, who is one of the past Buddhas, was born in Kashi, and it is said that the future Buddha, Maitre, will also be born in Kashi. On the other hand, it is believed by the Hindus that whoever attains death in Kashi will go direct to Swaraga, our heaven. Kashi is the place where we have the great Kashi Vishwanath Mandir, Kal Bhairav Mandir, Sankat Mochan Mandir, and Tulsi Manas Mandir, and so on, many sacred temples. So I welcome you once again to this great sacred land, the center of culture and temple city of ancient India. As you are all expert in the subject of sacred geometry and de design in nature, interplay of art, science, and philosophy, we would like to know what would be the reason for those who die in the Kashi to immediately or direct reach Vekuntha Swaraga? And what would be the reason for all the Buddha to attain enlightenment sitting on the Vajra throne in Buddha and that all the Buddhas come to Sarnath Kashi to deliver their first Dharma teaching? Is it because of certain quality of the particular land, just like petrol and gold mines, etc., are found? only the underneath certain area of the land. From Buddhist perspective, we believe that Vajrasit, which is situated in the Buddha Gaya, is the navel or the center of the universe. It is the only place where the energy of the old stars, planets, and five great elements abide in uninterrupted balanced mode. Because of this, 
the Vajra seed possesses the extraordinary, extraordinary power that facilitates one to see the reality of truth of nature. This is the very reason why Tathagata Buddhas choose this Vajra seed for attaining Buddhahood. Regarding Kashi, the literal meaning of the word Kashi is luminosity or light. Gopinath Kaviraj has said in his book, Bharatiya Sanskriti or Sadhana, that Kashi is surrounded by a flame of wisdom which appears like a fence from the old directions. And it is because of the reason that whenever a person's soul leaves its body in the Kashi, the soul goes directly upward to the Vekuntha or Swarag because it cannot be beyond, go beyond the flame of the wisdom like fence. In brief, the environment and surrounding of the Vajra seat in Budgaya and the sacredness of Kashi are due to the energy or environmental effect of those particular sites. We cannot see the special characteristics of those sites with our ordinary eyes because they can be seen only through the divine eyes. For example, it is like we cannot detect or trace the mines beneath the earth with our naked eyes. And we need machine or technology to see that. In the same way, the saints and other great beings who have attained great realization can only see the sacredness of those sites, but not us, the ordinary people. Over the course of these two days symposium, we will be shedding light on the importance of these sacred sites and we will find scientific reasons behind the potential of these sacred places and it will be surely be beneficial and enlightening for all of us. With these words, I wish all the visiting scholars a peaceful and meaningful stay in the Sarnath Varanasi with the blessing of Lord Buddha and Baba Vishabhnath. And I welcome you all once again to this land of sacred geometry. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Onju Doji Nigiji. Now next is uh, information to the symposium by co-chair Professor Madhu Kanaji. Namaskar. Well, I'm so overwhelmed by the whole atmosphere and the geomancy of the place that I don't know how to start this small, brief introduction to the symposium. Um, on this auspicious occasion, Honorable Vice Chancellor Ji, Geshe Navang Samton Ji, and our Honorable Guest, Professor K.D. Tripathi, who's the Chief Guest uh, one of the chief guests and important um, scholars who has done a lot of work in Sanskrit literature and in Kashi and who is a gold mine on a subject like this. Thank you for being here. Um, Professor Sisi Roy, my co-chair. Uh, my link with Professor Sisi Roy really goes back to about three years ago when I attended a seminar on consciousness in, in Bangalore. And I was amazed to see that among all the scientists that we have in India, he is so distinguished because he recognizes the role of religion, consciousness, and the great contribution that our sacred sciences, our religious traditions have made in, in, to, to science and his aim is really to bring both the streams together. So we are very fortunate, I'm very fortunate that we are co-chairing the session. Now, my, I also would um, like to welcome all our dear um, distinguished scholars, faculty members who are here, and of course the dear students. Now, um, friends, before I start, I want to um, pay my humble tribute with a little uh, publication, you know, a small memento I'd like to give to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, 
um, which a book that was published some years ago. So. So my purpose now is just to introduce you to some universal ideas uh, which form the bedrock of this symposium. Um, you know, when you survey religious traditions, one of the things that comes through when you look at the art that has evolved through the centuries, that they all have one particular universal element in common, and that is the sense of cosmic order. All religions in the world, when you see ancient art, one of the categories that is mirrored in the art form, whether it's a temple, whether it's dance, whether it's poetry, whether it is song, is these, this understanding of structure. And that structure is rooted in the idea of cosmic order. So there can be no aesthetic experience at least when you look at ancient and traditional arts, unless we align and identify with that cosmic order. So when we look at the Rig Veda, which as we know, is uh, one of the oldest scriptures of the world, um, and we know that the Rig Veda um, eulogizes the splendor and beauty of nature and innumerable gods, now, there are many terms for beauty uh, that are frequently used in the Vedas, uh, which, which come up again and again in different verses, such as Shri, which means splendor, Bhargas, which means glory, Vapu, beautiful, which means beautiful, Charu, or Chitra. And these terms are frequently used, but how do we understand those terms when they are used in terms to describe either nature or deities of the Vedic pantheon. Now what is important is that all these, the idea of beauty in the Vedas is deeply rooted in, uh, on the principle of cosmic order called Ritha, which is order in form that creates beauty. You know, this is the first premise uh, of uh, sacred geometry, I think, that it is order in form that creates beauty. If there was disorder, it would be something else. So it is, it is Ritha that reduces chaos to cosmos, gives it symmetry and harmony and a beautiful form. Now when we look at other cultures, say for instance, I looked at some of the works of a Greek philosopher, pre-Socratic uh, philosopher, uh, Philolos, now he says something similar. He says, the similar and the like would not need harmony. The dissimilar and the and unlike, however, had necessarily to be united by harmony and a sense of order, if it were to endure in the cosmos. So again, the idea of order, harmony, measurement, etc., comes in. Then when we look at the, uh, another passage from Shunon's works, who's written very extensively on perennial philosophy, he says, every cosmos, from, from the stars to smallest crystal, is a system in the sense that each one reflects the homogeneity of the principal order. The universe is woven of necessity and liberty, of mathematical rigor and musical play, of geometry and poetry. It's a beautiful Quote. So, no matter which religion or culture you study, even Islam, whether it's Islam, whether it is Christianity, whether it's Hinduism, whether it's Buddhism, Jainism, the idea of cosmic order, harmony, symmetry is central. And this is precisely which is never taught in uh, art history books, you know. So that is why we thought that it would be fantastic if the scientists can give their viewpoint on what constitutes these ideas and, the, and we look at these wonderful ideas to understand our uh, sacred representations better. So basically the, the symp 
symposium and I've given a, sh a short note. Nevertheless, I'd just like to uh, share it with you. Uh, so the symposium proposes to bring together ideas governing the aesthetic structure of the cosmos as seen through the lens of science and the wisdom-oriented traditions of the world. And, and we've already heard the previous speaker so beautifully talked about the geomancy of Banaras and Kashi and Sarnath. So we've already had an introduction that when we talk of sacred geometry, we are not localizing it only to an icon or a mandala or a yantra or the temple, but also, also spaces, geocosm, possibly the environment, you know. Uh, so we, it, it has many, many, many different levels. The symposium attempts to explore the underlying interplay of cosmological art, science and philosophy, and groundbreaking insights from research in quantum physics, cosmology, and theories of, of the creation of the universe. And Professor Sishir Roy, of course, will be introducing uh, us to the scientific aspect of it. Now, the, this symposium is interdisciplinary and cross-cultural. Uh, the this, this, this symposium proposes to explore philosophies, uh, scientific disciplines, art histories, religious cosmologies and worldviews that reflect upon the parallels that can be drawn between the grand design of nature and the ways in which human creativity has represented the same from the deepest layers of human consciousness in their creative representations in art, science, and philosophical theories. So idea is we are looking at a convergence because I think we've all reached a period of history. It's a very great moment um, of history that all these disciplines are now converging together to find a universal meaning rather than separating science from art and separating philosophies from science. Now we have reached a point uh, of, of human evolution where science and art should come together. So sacred geometry in all the world's religions, for example, has been conceived as a study of spatial order governed by number, ratio, succession of proportional relationships or formal elements. These ideas were greatly strengthened in the West by the theory of golden ratio, Fibonacci sequences, and fractals in mathematics. In India, their theoretical and mathematical formulations formed a part of the Vastu Vidya, the Hindu system of architecture that describes the Hindu principles of design, ground plan, and spatial geometry. The ancient Shilpa Shastra in India developed its own indigenous methods of measures and proportions called Talman, a system based on palm of hand from tip of the middle finger to the wrist. The method which appears to be simple is indeed very complex in its application and played a major role in the creation of the magnificent Hindu temples and Buddhist stupas throughout the subcontinent. The symmetry design of the archetypal temple with its countless variations spread to Asia and to Southeast Asia, splendid embodiments of the principles of sacred geometry are found in sacred art and architecture of the world's religions, Hindu, Buddhist, Islam, and Christianity, where the principles of sacred geometry are applied in monumental architecture, sculptures, in form of icons of the gods and goddesses, and in all forms of sacred geometrical abstract mandalas and yantras. The most universal and admired ritual image of Buddhism is the sacred mandala, which literally means the container of essence of the world, based on the mathematical perfection of the square and circle. The mandala for worship are traced by monks who have undergone a long period of technical artistic training and memorization of tracing iconic symbols of the pantheon of the gods, along with their color codes and related metaphysical concepts. The cognate of the Buddhist mandala is the Hindu Sri Chakra or the Sri Yantra, composed of nine interlacing triangles, a masterpiece of abstraction of Hindu Shakta Tantra, the symbol of Goddess Tripursundari. Its construction is based on strict laws of sacred geometry. 
so is the case of hundreds of sacred ritual diagrams used in Vedic ritual, Agamic, and Tantric meditative practices. Uh, these sacred icons have survived because of the inherent perfection of beauty and symmetry. Similarly, interlaced circles and square multi-sided polygons, the ubiquitous star patterns, form the basis of the quintessential buildings of Islam, the mosque, masjid, place of prayer, study and reflection. The, perf the perfection of Islamic dome have emerged from the perfection of the subdivision of the circular grids. They are inspired from the unity of the one God and the center, the sacred site of Mecca, toward which all Muslims orient their prayer. Whether in Abraham Abrahamic uh, monotheistic religions or in Paul or in our multiple Hindu and Buddhist religions, mathematics and sacred geometry featured greatly in all forms of artistic manifestations. The inspiration for sacred geometry came from the notion that incomprehensible unity of the macrocosm needs to be embodied in visual representations and perfection of formal elements that resonate the highest ideals of aesthetic beauty. The representation of sacred art increasingly support the dynamic interplay of energy forces and interconnection of all elements, including humans whose physical and psychic makeup is analogically homologized with the whole of creation. So this symposium to summit is based on the conviction that all nature and its various forms of human creativity at its most refined level, speak the same language. One that is governed by order, symmetry and beauty, and one where science and art meet. Thank you very much. So this is what we are hoping to explore. Thank you, madam. Now we have keynote address by Professor C.C. Royji. Uh, good morning, everybody. Honorable Chief Guest, uh, Tripathi Ji, uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Geshe Shamtenji, and the Chairman of the Organizing Committee, and the Professor Modhuji, my co chair in the Daesh, and distinguished speakers who took the trouble to come here from various places in India, and my uh, colleagues and faculties of this institute and the students. I am basically a theoretical physicist. So uh, I've spent my whole life working on theoretical physics, and especially quantum theory. And so people might, my colleagues especially, they might think why I am here to give a speech or, or why I am participating in this type of conference on sacred geometry. Because sacred geometry is not really uh, work done uh, or, or discussed in the context of physics or quantum physics. But in, in physics, especially in the modern physics, if we start with uh, Sir Isaac Newton's paradigm to 21st century, the physicists are always interested in geometry. Even they go beyond what we call geometry, and then of course I will come why I am interested in sacred geometry. First, we need to understand why scientists, or especially physicists, they are interested in discussing or understanding geometry itself. So to understand the geometry itself, they ask a more deeper questions. How the universe is being manifested? What is the origin of the universe? So this type of questions were discussed even before physicists, uh, philosophers for many, many centuries. And uh, I am tempted to uh, quote a statement from His Holiness Dalai Lama. And uh, he said that even with all these profound scientific theories of the origin of the universe, 
I am left with serious questions. What existed before Big Bang? Because Big Bang is supposed to be the present day accepted theory of cosmology. And where did they come from? So what caused it? Why they are uh, planets evolved uh, planets evolved to support. So this type of questions, uh, His Holiness, he nicely presented in one of his books. And uh, people are nowadays are divided into two groups. Uh, some people say these are metaphysical questions. So uh, we, we, uh, we don't bother about what is the origin of the universe, what was before the so-called Big Bang Theory called so we should not bother about it. Another group of physicists, they think that no, if we can understand the origin of the universe and what is there before the bang occur or big bang occur, then it might to help our understanding of the whole cosmos. And not only cosmos, there lies a very deeper questions. How the forms are created. If you look at the manifested universe nowadays, you'll see there are a lot of, lot of forces like gravitational forces, electromagnetic forces, strong and weak forces, many type of forces are there and many type of objects like stars, galaxies, and they have different structures, different forms. So the question is how from the primitive stage, these type of forms or patterns are being created. These are now the topics of discussions among the modern cosmologists. So, uh, there are two types of views on that regarding the origin of the universe. One is uh, modern cosmology. Most of the modern cosmologists who did believe on the Big Bang cosmology. I will tell you later on that what do you mean by Big Bang cosmology and what they believe it. Another is we have kind of insights or many discussions in our ancient Indian wisdom by both Buddhist and non-Buddhist one. And people are trying to find out whether the concepts discussed in ancient Indian wisdom are similar or parallel or convergent with the concepts we are dealing in modern cosmology. And after understanding the parallels, convergence or divergence, more serious people working on modern cosmology, they are asking whether we can get insights by studying ancient Indian wisdom. This is very, very important questions because unless we get some insights from Indian wisdom, Indian wisdom, why we'll study, why we'll spend our time to understand ancient Indian wisdom. They, will, they might say, well, you people are going uh, to be retired, so on the retired life, people have to do something, do philosophy, studying ancient Indian wisdom and spend time. This type of questions, many, many serious scientists are raising nowadays. So the people, the speakers and other participants, they need to think seriously what kind of insights or whether at all any insights we can get it by studying ancient Indian wisdom, which will help in understanding the modern science itself. So, <coughs> to understand the forms, as I told you, say, uh, if you look the uh, characteristics of law of gravitation, the apple is falling towards earth. So why apple is falling towards earth? Newton, he formulated his theory or Newtonian theory of gravitation. Then Albert Einstein, he came and he told that uh, gravitation can be described by a non-Euclidean geometry. What is non-Euclidean geometry? Euclidean geometry means we use a concept of straight lines, triangles and some of its properties. And non-Euclidean means these are, suppose you are considering a sphere and 
you are trying to draw some triangles on the surface of the sphere. It's not possible really, if you try it very hard, you cannot draw a triangle which you do it in everyday life, you cannot do it on the sphere. So for that, uh, mathematicians or geometers, they developed a geometry called curved geometry and Riman is one of the mathematicians and according to his name is called Riemannian geometry. So Einstein told, he discovered theory of relativity. The two parts, one is special theory of relativity, another is general theory of relativity. So according to general theory of relativity, he told that because space-time or geometry is curved, not Euclidean, that's why we have gravitation. Then people asked, why geometry is curved? He said, because there is gravitation. So it, it, uh, you don't really get answered. Because of curvature of the geometry, you get gravitation. On the other way, because of gravitation, you have curvature of the geometry. So these questions of why, we are not able to solve it. It's a kind of description. So physicists, for other type of interactions like electromagnetic field or strong field, they are also trying to describe it, its characteristics with the help of geometry. So the question is, what is the ontology of geometry? Can we think more primitive notions than what we call geometry? I mean, in any form, in any um, patterns we see in the nature or what we call sacred geometry, even there you need to consider a kind of straight line, kind of triangles. But if we ask more basic questions, what is behind these triangles? What is behind this straight line? Because if you want to have a straight line, you need a kind of ordering of the points. Suppose you take two points and <coughs> you need to connect these two points, say A and B, by what, uh, uh, by, by which way? So you need to think a kind of ordering. Say A is nearer to B or A is away from B. So by that you need to define a concept called distance function. So you need to define a distance. And how can we define a distance? You need a measurement. How do, what do you mean by measurement? Suppose we want to measure a distance here uh, in the table. So uh, during era of Newton, Newtonian paradigm, people used ideally a body called rigid body. So, or, or what we say scales. So with that scale, you can measure what is the distance between two points A and B. Then Einstein came with his theory of special theory of relativity, he said, no, the concept of rigid body is no longer valid. And you need to use concept of light. So how, much, how the light comes from point A to B, and with the help of light, you can define the distance. So first things, you need a set of points. Then what Madhuji told, kind of ordering. You need the ordering with the help of measurement or instrumentations. So you need kind of basic principles to come to the geometrization or geometric figures. So in my technical session, I will speak on what is the ontology of geometry means, what are the more primitive notions behind any kind of geometry. And then the issue is that starting with this primitive notion, how forms or patterns are being created. In modern physics, there is a uh, particular branch of research called nonlinear dynamics. What they do there, they uh, are able to show that even all types of patterns you can generate by using kind of vibrations or uh, kind of <coughs> fluctuations. So if you look at the ocean, then uh, if you put some perturbations like placing somebody or throwing stones in the 
water of the ocean, then there will be ripples, waves. So different types of patterns are being created. So people nowadays discover that mathematically you can show that how these patterns or different types of geometrical patterns are being produced. An infinite number of patterns you can generate out of a mathematical framework. So the issue is how from formless you are going to form and from form you have various type of geometry. So we need to understand how forms are being originated and then uh, how many many types of forms not only in physical level in biological system biological arena also I, I'll show in my lecture that how different type of biological forms are being originated and uh, th these biological forms if you compare with the forms in the physical object there are a kind of difference so what is the difference difference is that for living being or biological form, forms play very important role for the functioning of the organism. So this is very, very important because, uh, you know, uh, the, for a human being, this kind of form is necessary for its functioning also. But we can't say that if you take a stone, why the stone is like spherical, is, is the spherical nature has any important role in understanding its dynamics. This is different from biological forms and its functioning. We tried to invite one specialist working on morphogenesis or evolution of the forms in biological domain, but uh, at the end he cancelled because of some unknown reasons and he didn't come. Otherwise, you'd see that how different type of biological forms or morphogenesis happen even from a uh, caterpillar, how the beautiful butterfly originated. So this is a morphogenesis. And uh, maybe I will uh, show you a few. Uh, this is the primary creation hymns by Rig Veda, Mandala 10, and there are seven mantras. And they describe uh, the, how the creation was started. And then this is a supercomputer simulation of the vibration at the beginning of the universe. I mean, before manifestation of the universe, there was a uh, substratum called vacuum or we call quantum vacuum. So this vacuum is full of fluctuations, full of vibration. And this vibration is because of the quantum principles called Heisenberg uncertainty principles. So because of the existence of Heisenberg uncertainty principles, there will be enormous fluctuations in that vacuum. And because of the fluctuations of the vacuum, lot of energy is being generated. And that energy gives rise to manifestation of the universe. And people used a supercomputer to draw what kind of patterns or form being generated by these primordial fluctuations or vibration. And next comes, this is also another computer simulation of the primordial patterns generations. Why, why I am showing you? Because out of that, during the evolution process, many, many other patterns, even what we call sacred geometry, Riemannian geometry, all kinds of geometry, should have kind of origin of this, uh, what we call primordial or substratum called quantum vacuum. And then uh, in physics, 21st century physics, I am just going to finish my talk within few minutes. And uh, uh, scientists discover that uh, there is a smallest scale of length. We, we measure with a scale like inch, centimeter, millimeter, millicentimeter, or if you go down, nanoscale, if you go further down, uh, scale of the quantum like electron 10 to the power minus 13 centimeter you cannot really conceive what is 10 to the power minus 30, 13 centimeter and they go further down and down ultimately they reach to a very small scale called Planck scale do you know its value 10 to the power minus 33 centimeter no 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 we, we cannot really visualize it 
uh, just I am telling you a number, but this number is so small that uh, really we cannot do anything of that. So they got the smallest scale 10 to the power minus 13, 3, 33 centimeter or in time temporal scale is 10 to the power minus 43 uh, second. This is also we cannot think of. So okay, fine. How they, they got it? They got it by using, there are some constants called fundamental constants in nature, uh, which are gravitational constants, speed of light, and what is they called Planck constant. So out of this constant, you can build up this type of scales called Planck scale. And uh, you know, by the way, I am telling you, there is a debate uh, going on regarding the existence of these uh, smallest and definite numerical number like speed of light or Planck. Speed of light is 3 into 10 to the power 10 centimeter per second. This is a numerical value experimentally verified. And this raises a lot of debate in Buddhist philosophy. Uh, maybe in some other lectures, if we, we, we can discuss this, what debates it gives rise. But OK, let us uh, granted that these are the observational values and we find a small scale in the physical universe. OK, so what are the problems? Problem is that beyond the scale, there is no concept of space, no concept of time, or no concept of causality. Causality, cause and effect relationship, which is the, one of the pillars of modern science. So even at the certain scale, if there are no concept of space, no concept of time, no concept of causality, so how we are getting it at everyday life? In everyday life, you can say, oh, well, this is the space. This chair is occupying certain space, table is occupying certain space. So if at a certain scale, we don't have concept of space, time, causality, how these being emerged? This is very, very challenging issue in 21st century physics. So these are uh, the basic questions which gives rise to think of what is the ontology of geometry? What is the ontology of space-time? In, in my technical session, I will elaborate it. But finally, when you say any type of geometry, sacred, non-sacred, whatever, we need to include the central nervous systems of human being. Without our functioning of the brain, uh, how can we visualize? Suppose one Buddhist monk, he is meditating on mandala, or a Hindu uh, mystic, he is meditating on Sri Jantra. So how it gives rise to go beyond the mundane world, or gives rise to transcendental world. You need, so you need to understand how the brain perceives the geometry, or what is the role uh, in the role of geometry in functioning of the brain. This is now one of the uh, forefront research in neuroscience. People say that uh, there is a term called sense-dependent geometry. Because we have visual system, look through our eyes we look to the outer world, through ears we, uh, we have auditory systems and smell, olfactory systems so whether the geometry itself is sense, sense dependent. I can remember uh, a statement by famous uh, physicist philosopher Ernest Mach. Once Ernest Mach, he was trying to analyze the analysis of sensations and how geometry is formed in the brain. Say uh, one century before he, he was guru of Albert Einstein. He was considered guru of Albert Einstein. He was a positivist philosopher and a great physicist. So he quoted two terms. One is called deductive geometry, as Greek people do it. And he quoted, according to his quote, I am telling, he called Hindu geometry. He coined the term Hindu geometry. And Hindu geometry, it is known as inductive geometry or sense-dependent geometry. So the new people in neuroscience, they're trying to understand what is the sense, 
mean by sense dependent geometry. And by understanding that, probably we have a serious uh, overlap of understanding between the worshipper of uh, Sri Jantra or Mandala and the scientist. And uh, it will really lead to new vistas in understanding. So let me finish my lecture, thanking again to all of you for listening. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now, next is Professor K. R. Tirpati ji uh, to please deliver the guest of honor speech. Since we are running short of time, I it is not suitable for me to request, but it is not beyond my control, and I request you to shorten your speech at uh, up to 15 minutes, please. Most Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Something, Dr. Madhukanna, Professor Shishir Roy, Professor Negi, distinguished scholars, revered monks, and friends. First of all, at the outset, I must express my gratitude for having given this opportunity to interact with you. And that too, on a mind-boggling symposium, Sacred Geometry and Design in Nature, an interplay of art, science, and philosophy, organized by the Central University of Tibetan Studies, Sarnath Varanasi, in collaboration with the Center for Indic and Agamic Studies in Asia, which is Delhi-based. Friends, as Dr. Madhukanna has initiated this entire discussion with reference to the cosmic order, I would like to proceed a little further on this line. This speculation on the cosmology and cosmogony has been a shared theme of almost all ancient world civilizations, including ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Egypt, ancient Iran, ancient India, and China including Tibet. However, I am not qualified to speak on all these ancient traditions which interact with each other and have interacted with each other in ancient times. I am reminded of a very great scholar hailing from this holy city of Varanasi, Mahamopadhyay, Gopinath Kaviraj. He has written quite a lot, mostly in Bangla and in Hindi. I'm afraid this is the reason why people at large in the world are known, are not familiar with that great scholar. 
And therefore, this exploration into the sacred geography and the cosmic order has been a favorite sort of subject for Indian scholars and especially the scholars in Varanasi. Cosmology and cosmic order has been discussed in both the primary sources of Indian wisdom, the Vedic as well as Agamic. Vedas speak of Ratha, which means the cosmic order. No cosmos can be imagined in a chaotic way and therefore there is a perceived order existing in the whole cosmos. And if there is an order in the generation of cosmos and the origin of the cosmos, there must be some order in re-emulating the same in our ritual religious spiritual life. Therefore, the second meaning of the Rita is the sacrificial order or yajnik order. And if entire cosmos is in a given order, which is remembered in the renewal of the sacrifice, then there is no point that this entire human life is without order. And that order is reflected in our own law of karman and law of rebirth, both. Again, this entire system is based on the basic principle financial principles, and that is the unity of the macrocosm and the microcosm. First thing, there must be some unity between the microcosm and the microcosm. There must be unity of the internal and external. There must be unity between the abstract and the gross. These are three guiding principles of all the religion of the Indian origin, including Vedic and Buddhist, Jain, and all others. Friends, therefore, if there, if there is order, the foundational thing, then there must be some sort of symmetry. And then the question, how the emergence of the form? That basic question which has been based, raised by our physicist scholar, wondering, wonder is there how this emergence of the form and this question has been raised in the well-known Vedic hymn Nasadiya him. No sadasit, na sadasit. With this, the question is there whether there was sat or there was asat. Whether both they existed or ni neither of them. Was it a darkness pervading the entire? It's a poetic language, metaphoric language, excellently done. And one of the great, another scholar of the Varanasi, Professor Vasudev Sharanagrawal, has dwelt upon this question and he has explained his entire cosmological study is based on the Nasadi Yesu. So that is how the second question is that of the uh, not only cosmos, 
not only the cosmic order, then the cosmological process, the emergence of the form from whether non-form, if non-form emerging this form from the plenitude or shunya. I would not translate shunya as void. So this is whether the question, basic question is there, emergence of the form from Purna, Pledinshut, Brahman, or the Shunya. These are two trends, and I, we all know that in entire Indian tradition, this question has been debated centuries for centuries, and it culminates into the thought of the Shaivite Agamas and the Shakta Agamas. These Agamas, on the one hand, discuss about the beauty, the form, creation of the form, the nature of the form, the kinds of the form, whether it, it is the Vindu, that point, which, which if runs parallel, then it forms a line, and if it spreads in all the sides, then it becomes a mandala, chakra, and this chakra may be intersected in various ways, triangle is there. So this, this all questions, all these questions have been discussed in detail in the Agamas, in the Shakta Agamas, in the Vaishnava Agamas, and in the uh, Shaivite Agamas, all the three Agamas. So much so, how in our religious practice and why this ritual takes place? And this question has been raised for the first time in the Vaishnava, Vaishnavite Agama of the Vaikhansa variety in Kashyapiya Dhyanakanda. This question has been discussed in detail. I am very much conscious of the time limit. Within 15 minutes, I have to somehow uh, sum up things. So friends, all these questions, basic questions have been discussed. And it's a matter of uh, joy that though the era of the earlier scientific speculations was over with the emergence of the quantum theory. And now the frontiers of the philosophy, religion, physics, astronomy, new chemistry, biology, they are vanishing and we are at the threshold. We, we are the, 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 the age of dialogue has emerged without having given this opportunity. We cannot find this answer. The emergence, the last question which has been raised by Professor Roy, is emergence of form sense dependent and the vice versa, we can raise the question, is the emergence of form chit oriented or consciousness oriented? These are the questions. Two questions are there. How to answer these? It would be very difficult given time. I could have explained this question how it has been given some answer, not the final, but some answer has been given in the philosophy of grammar, in the philosophy of language, Indian philosophy of language, the uh, philosophy of the language which emerges as a result of the dialogue between the Buddhist philosophy and the Vedic philosophy of language and the great philosopher Bhartrihari 
is there. The way he has answered and the way his answer has been debated for next six centuries. This is a wonderful sort of a study. And I think this symposium will give, will offer some sort of interaction between the Buddhist thought, Buddhist Agamas, and the Vedic Agamas, how they have interacted with each other, how they flourished, how this entire region developed more from Tibet to Japan, from Sri Lanka to Thailand and beyond. It's a wonderful sort of uh, study. And it is not simply a question of study. It's a question of experience, a spiritual experience. Uh, we have not to reduce everything in insentient nature. We have to think in terms of our own self. The unity, there are two levels of the creation. The physical creation, entire cosmos, and the creation within, which, which is the, uh, which we do, the, from psychic, from consciousness to the physicality and the union of the, and the unity of the both, this has to be taken into consideration. And I, ho I hope that today's seminar will ponder over it, ponder over it seriously and offer its own contribution in this direction. I again express my gratitude to Dr. Madhukanna, who remembered me, and to Honorable Vice Chancellor of this great university. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, before presidential address, there's the one book that, uh, which is to be released right now. So I request Honorable Vice-Chancellor to unveil this book. About the book Diksha Prakasha, the newly edited edition of the book Diksha Prakasha brought out jointly by the Tandra Foundation and DK Print World. It is an authentic compilation based on a Sharadi Lithilalka Tandra. The work covers the wide range of topics such as tantric form of initiations, activation of tantra mantras by means of exotic rituals and worship of deities. The book is edited by Professor Shidala Parsad Ubadeya, the Shevaga Agama Acharya at the Department of the uh, Sankhya, Yoga, Tantra and Agama at the Sambun Anasanska University, Varanasi. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, Chief Guest Address, I may I request Professor Nawa uh, Samdinji to please come. Sarvadrishti Parhanaya Saddhamam Madeshyat Anukambam Upadaya Tam Kodamam Namami. The Honorable Sangha. Respected Professor Giti Tibadiji, respected Professor Sisi Raiji, and uh, Madam uh, Madhukhanaji, Dr. Madam Madhukhanaji, and uh, the distinguished scholars who have come from different parts of the country to attend this uh, two day conference, and uh, the faculties of these universities research members, staff, and students. This is uh, a, a kind of a unique uh, uh, symposium. Few months back, uh, Professor Sisi Raiji and uh, Dr. Madhukhanaji um, approached me to organize this kind of conference so that we can have a better interaction addressing it from different angles, from a Buddhist perspective, from non-Buddhist Indian philosophical traditions, and from the scientific traditions, which all of these three are have a very rich tradition 
studying the cosmic and geometry and mathematics and all about uh, trying, making an attempt to know the nature of reality and nature of the universe. So this uh, symposium, the sacred geometry and design in nature. So I don't, I don't know whether this, you know, every kind of sacred, uh, geometry is a sacred, but uh, certainly geometry, every form, is governed by geometry. And uh, when we say an interplay of art, science, and philosophy, the art is expression, whether it is in the form of uh, forms or it is in the form of, uh, you know, voice. In whatever form it comes, it is all about the expressions, that is art. And then behind that art, we have uh, the metaphysical kind of uh, uh, analysis and metaphysical nature, the metaphysics regarding which the philosophers speculate, try to understand the nature. And in India, this has been a major kind of enterprise for the last uh, several millennia and has a very rich uh, tradition of exploring the universe, not only exploring the external universe, but also exploring the inner uh, universe, which is much more complicated than the external universe and much more deeper. When we heard and uh, we, many questions and uh, uh, ideas were posed and uh, presented uh, for consideration and contemplation and speculation and analysis uh, for the next two, year, two days. Of course, uh, the, there is, as uh, uh, Dr. Madhukhana ji said that, uh, there is a cosmic order in whichever we see. Certainly that is true. In whichever form we see, there is a cosmic order. From Buddhist perspective, that is uh, causality. Even if we find that something to be chaos, it is within order. Suppose a, a house gets burned. From our social perspective, it is chaos. But from the causality point of view, it is in order. It has all the necessary causes and conditions because of which it has, the results are brought and the things happened. So everything, there's nothing in this universe, in the entire cosmic universe, there's nothing that happen, that uh, does not happen uh, without a causal system, without being governed by rather to say without, without being governed by uh, the causal system. So either it is a, a micro level or it's a macro level. Both of these are totally intertwined. The macro is a manifestation of uh, the micro, right? So in the similar manner when, and we don't have time, actually we should be having a tea break at this moment. But being the last speaker, always uh, the last speaker has uh, um, advantage as well as disadvantage. So I have to sum up and uh, should not be taking much time because we are already running out of time and uh, if we keep going then we will miss uh, and uh, the, the other remaining sessions, the following sessions will not be in on time. So I will speak very briefly, whatever I, you know, I have few points out of that, I, I shall try to speak uh, some of them. Um, the mandala is, uh, the universe itself is, uh, from a Buddhist perspective, is a result of the karma of sentient beings. And similarly, the mandala is uh, a deliberate kind of uh, transformation of uh, the celestial abode as well as manifestation, uh, as well as the manifestation of the person into a deity's form. So actually, 
mandala that we find here is one of the you know, thousands of mandalas, and that is actually meditated deliberately during the meditation sessions. And when one becomes uh, quite kind of uh, accomplished, and then fully when the person becomes uh, accomplished, then the person is transformed into deity's form, and the, his uh, entire manifestation, the, uh, the, the, the um, visualizations that are materialized at the end, and this kind of celestial abode comes into existence uh, in reality, and that is the mandala. And it has certainly, when these mandalas are you know, drawn and uh, depicted in two-dimensional ways and uh, three-dimensional ways, uh, they have a complex uh, geometrical kind of uh, uh, you know, display and uh, which the, only the accomplished uh, artist can do uh, who go uh, through training for several years. They so then we have uh, also like uh, in our history, uh, what is circle, what is triangle, what is you know, the, uh, the square and things like that. So, in the Platonic uh, philosophy, there is no perfect uh, uh, circle, right? The perfect circle is uh, the divine circle. This raises a very big kind of you know, issue, and also it addresses a very uh, fund fundamental issue that already in India was being contemplated for several centuries. Because if you look into this, circle from a microscopic perspective, then you won't find a circle. It is with the dotted and it is with the broken lines. So therefore, you cannot find a perfect circle. So where is that perfect circle? Perfect circle is there in the divine you know, world. And this is a kind of abstract universe, universal of a, you know, the uh, circle. Similarly, if you look into the Indian, uh, you know, epistemological uh, debates and uh, discussions and interactions regarding which uh, Professor Tripathi uh, you know, brought up, there has been a rich interaction between the Vedic schools and the non-Vedic schools in India, a rich, which helped each other in bringing the entire system a very, you know, to a very sophistic sophisticated level. So in that course, when we talk about the universals, then the universals are, according to the Vaisheshikas and the Nayayikas, are absolute, permanent. And from the Sotantrika's point of view, the circle, the universals are mental constructs. But still, again, within Buddhist philosophy, various Buddhist philosophical schools, they are mental constructs, but they are, you know, inherently existent. But when it goes into different levels of schools, I won't go into the rest of the things, but uh, jumping to the level of uh, Madhimika, ontologically, the circle and the universals are, you know, the uh, mental constructs. But from the Madhimika perspective, not only the universals are mental construct, but also the rest of the, you know, the particulars, the entire universe is merely designated by language and thought. Vaisheshikas, uh, the Vaibhashikas and Sautantrikas and the Chittamatrins are realist schools. From the Madhimika's point of view, if we subscribe to the view of a universe being a realist, then we will not be in a position to, to undermine the foundation on the basis of which our afflictive emotions arise, which are finally responsible to the, you know, the, the, the bad karmas which bring sufferings. 
because after all, the in every, all of the Indian philosophical schools have contemplated on philosophy in order to bring some realization for the sake of shunning the sufferings. So that is why, in order to understand the ontological nature of the reality, the phenomena, or the particulars, or the universe, there is a system, a very rich system of uh, understanding the phenomenology. Through the phenolo phenomenological experience, then we can shun the suffering through the understanding of uh, the very complex system. So therefore, I think, uh, uh, already we are eight minutes behind, so I sh should not go further. The topic we are discussing here is, uh, for some of our students might think that this is not very much relevant to our life, but it is very much uh, relevant to our life, to our body, mind, and uh, speech. And the geometry represents the body, and then the science and philosophy also, you know, represents uh, the study and studying the nature of uh, mind and body and the entire universe. So in order to have a comprehensive and complete approach of understanding our life, uh, it is important to understand and address these issues. Uh, so once again, I thank uh, Professor Sisi Raiji and uh, Dr. Madhukhana ji and the rest of all the uh, s scholars uh, for being with us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now we have a uh, vote of thanks sessions. I request for Professor Devraj Singh. Honorable Vice Chancellor of this university, Professor Geshe Yan Samtenji. Guest of honor, Professor K.D. Tripathi ji. Professor Sisi Roy ji. Professor Madhu Khanna ji, distinguished scholars from different parts of the country, our faculty members, staff members, dear students. I have got this opportunity to express my thanks to all of you. So first of all, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor who has always been a source of inspiration for conducting and organizing such academic activities. This event is also an output, rather outcome, of his constant and continuous academic observance and encouragement. I do express my gratitude to Professor Kedi Tripathi ji, guest of honor, Professor Sisi Roy, Professor Madhu Khanna ji for their lectures, brief lectures and keynote address in which they have raised so many questions. And I hope that the lectures and keynote address will unfold manifold dimensions for discussions and deliberations in the coming academic sessions. I do, I would also like to record my thanks to uh, the distinguished scholars who have taken pain to come here from different parts of the countries to participate in this symposium and will enrich, certainly they will enrich uh, this symposium with their profound knowledge on the subjects. My thanks are due to all the faculty members who are here to make this event as a successful event. And I know I do not have any words to express my thanks in a word to those who have directly and or indirectly extended their helping hands for the successful organization of this event. 
my thanks are also due to both the institutions this uh, agmic studies delhi and advanced studies bangalore who have shown their faith and trust in us uh, and made this collaboration for organization of this symposium at last but not the least i would like to express my thanks to my students who are assembled in this assembly to make this event more successful with their omnipotence thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you very much thank you thank you dr devraj ji now we have arranged some simple refreshment at uh, library lawn so all are requested to join there ngelan number dalu do number linki samala pa penzu gi tangla she do ta di shu re in samala she ji pero nas to she okay then next lecture session will be in ab guest house